Most Fallout fans think the Brotherhood of Steel dominates with their power armor, or maybe the NCR wins through sheer numbers. But here's the thing. Science reveals that the faction everyone overlooks actually has the best shot at long-term survival. Today, we're ranking all 10 major factions using real-world criteria military logistics, population sustainability, resource management, and technological advancement. We're not talking about who's the coolest or most heroic. We're asking which faction could actually survive and thrive for centuries in a post-apocalyptic world. The answer might surprise you. The Atom Cats look incredibly cool with their customized power armor and greaser aesthetic, but style doesn't equal survival. They've got maybe a dozen members total, nowhere near the minimum viable population for long-term sustainability. Worse, they have zero manufacturing capability. Each piece of their impressive power armor was scavenged or stolen from someone else. Their entire existence depends on finding pre-war tech and spare parts. What happens when the fusion core runs out? When the servos break down? When the armor plating gets damaged beyond their repair skills? They're completely parasitic on existing technology without any ability to maintain or replace their equipment. They have no recruitment strategy, no expansion plan, no agricultural base, no medical infrastructure, nothing that resembles a sustainable civilization. They're basically a motorcycle gang with power armor, living off the fading glory of pre-war engineering. They receive Tier F, doomed to extinction within five to 10 years. The Gunners actually have impressive military organization and combat effectiveness. They're disciplined, well-equipped, and tactically competent. In a straight fight, they could probably take on most other factions and win. But here's their fatal flaw. The mercenary business model is fundamentally unsustainable. Mercenaries need clients who can pay them. They need a stable economy around them to provide contracts and resources. But in the post-apocalyptic wasteland, who's got the caps to keep hiring them long-term? Their entire resource acquisition strategy depends on external contracts and payment. They have no sustainable population base because they don't control civilian settlements. No agriculture, no manufacturing, no resource infrastructure. They're essentially military specialists without the civilian economy needed to support a military. It's like having a professional army without a country to back it up. When the contracts dry up, and they will, the gunners have no fallback plan. They can't transition to self-sufficiency because they've built their entire organization around being hired guns. They receive Tier D, military strong but economically unsustainable. The organized raider gangs of Nuka World represent a step up from random wasteland bandits. They've got territorial control, leadership structures, and coordinated strategies. The Disciples, Operators, and Pack each bring different strengths to raiding operations, but their economy is entirely parasitic. They survive by stealing from settlements, capturing slaves, and extorting tribute. This creates a fundamental sustainability problem. They need victims to exploit, but successful raiding eventually eliminates or drives away those victims. They don't produce food, manufacture equipment, or develop technology. Population growth requires constant recruitment through violence and coercion, which isn't exactly a stable demographic strategy. Their territorial expansion is limited by the need to maintain enough prey settlements to sustain their lifestyle. The raider model works short term, but fails long term. Eventually, you run out of people to rob, or your victims organize effective resistance, or a stronger faction eliminates you. Without productive economy activity, raiders are always living on borrowed time. They receive Tier D, doomed without host to exploit. The railroad deserves respect for what they do. They're incredibly effective at their specialized mission of liberating synths from institute control. Their intelligence network is sophisticated, their operatives are skilled, and they've developed impressive stealth technology and memory wiping techniques. They're probably the best covert organization in the Commonwealth. But here's their fatal vulnerability. They're a single purpose organization that becomes obsolete if their mission succeeds. What happens to the railroad after all the synths are freed? What happens if the institute falls or stops producing synths? Their entire organizational structure, recruitment strategy, and resource allocation revolves around one specific goal. They maintain a small, secretive population with extremely limited growth potential. Secrecy requirements mean they can't openly recruit or expand their membership base. They have no broader economic foundation, no agricultural production, no manufacturing capability beyond their specialized equipment. They're essentially a resistance movement, and resistance movements don't build lasting civilizations. 
The railroad represents tactical brilliance, but strategic short-sightedness. They're solving an important moral problem, but they're not building a sustainable future for themselves or anyone else. They receive Tier C, effective but strategically limited. The Minutemen have admirable democratic ideals and genuine care for local communities. Their settlement network model could theoretically create a resilient, distributed civilization. Each settlement contributes resources and manpower while maintaining local autonomy. It's actually a pretty smart approach to post-apocalyptic governance, but they have one catastrophic flaw. Their command structure is completely dependent on a single individual, the general. Without that central leadership figure, the entire organization falls apart. The decentralization that makes them resilient also makes them inefficient. Resource sharing between settlements is voluntary and inconsistent. Military response times are terrible because forces are scattered across the Commonwealth with no central coordination. When Diamond City gets attacked, how long does it take to mobilize help from settlements on the other side of the map? Their democratic decision-making process, while admirable, is painfully slow in crisis situations. Try getting 20 different settlement leaders to agree on strategy when raiders are already at the gates. The Minutemen work great for local problems, but struggle with anything requiring coordinated large-scale response. The fundamental tension between local autonomy and collective action has never been resolved. They're either too decentralized to act decisively or too centralized around one leader to survive leadership transitions. They receive Tier C, good intentions, poor execution. The Brotherhood of Steel looks impressive on paper. Advanced power armor, energy weapons, vertebrates, and disciplined military organization. Their hierarchical structure maintains order and their technological superiority gives them tactical advantages in most conflicts. They're basically medieval knights with laser rifles but they have several fatal flaws that prevent long-term dominance. First, their recruitment restrictions create a massive population bottleneck. They only accept outsiders in limited numbers and under strict conditions. Most of their population growth comes from internal reproduction, which severely limits their expansion potential. Their technology hoarding policy actively prevents economic growth. Instead of sharing advanced manufacturing techniques or establishing trade relationships, they jealously guard their technological advantages. This isolates them economically and prevents the specialization and trade networks that drive sustainable growth. They're completely dependent on scavenging pre-war technology rather than developing new production capabilities. What happens when the last cache of energy cells is found? When the final suit of T-51 power armor breaks down beyond repair? They're living off technological inheritance without building technological legacy. Their isolationist ideology limits expansion and prevents beneficial alliances. They see themselves as technology's guardians rather than civilization's builders. It's like medieval guilds that maintain quality through exclusivity, but stagnated because they refuse to adapt or expand. The Brotherhood represents military excellence trapped by ideological limitations. They could dominate the wasteland militarily, but they can't sustain that dominance economically or demographically. They receive Tier B. Strong military, weak sustainability. Caesar's Legion has mastered something most factions struggle with, rapid expansion and cultural assimilation. They've built a massive territory stretching across multiple states, absorbing dozens of tribes into a unified military culture. Their logistics are impressive, their discipline is unquestionable, and they've solved the succession problem through clear institutional hierarchy. The Legion understands that sustainable power requires more than military strength, it needs cultural cohesion and institutional continuity. Caesar created a system that can survive his death with clear lines of succession and deeply ingrained organizational culture. That's more than most wasteland factions achieve, but they have one absolutely fatal flaw, deliberate technological regression. Caesar's ideology actively rejects advanced medicine, manufacturing, and infrastructure in favor of a pure classical civilization. They forbid advanced medical treatments, avoid complex machinery, and discourage scientific research. This isn't just philosophical preference, it's civilizational suicide. Their slavery-based economy is fundamentally less efficient than specialized free labor. Their rejection of advanced manufacturing means they can't maintain or improve their equipment. Their refusal of modern medicine means higher mortality rates and shorter lifespans. History shows us what happens to civilizations that deliberately reject technological advancement. They get conquered by those who embrace it. The Legion might expand rapidly now, but they're building a civilization that's guaranteed to fall behind technologically advanced opponents. They receive 
Tier B, expansion potential undermined by ideology. The New California Republic represents the closest thing to pre-war democratic civilization in the wasteland. They've got functioning democratic institutions, civilian government, and constitutional protections. The population base spans millions of people across multiple states, creating genuine economic diversity and specialization. The NCR has established trade networks, a stable currency system, and advanced agricultural production. They manufacture their own equipment, maintain infrastructure projects, and operate complex supply chains. Their military is professional rather than tribal, with standardized equipment and formal training programs. This is what sustainable civilization actually looks like. But the NCR has massive structural problems that threaten their long-term survival. Their biggest issue is catastrophic territorial overextension. They've expanded far beyond their ability to effectively govern or defend their territory. Their military is spread impossibly thin across vast distances, trying to patrol trade routes, garrison frontier towns, and fight multiple conflicts simultaneously. Corruption and bureaucratic inefficiency plague their government. Resources get diverted through graft and mismanagement. Decision-making is painfully slow because everything has to go through multiple layers of democratic process. When the Legion attacks the Hoover Dam, the NCR can't respond quickly because they're debating strategy in committee meetings. The resource drain from constant frontier conflicts is bleeding them dry. They're fighting the Legion in the east, raiders in the north, and trying to maintain order across territory larger than most pre-war nations. Every cap spent on military expansion is a cap not invested in infrastructure, education, or technological development. The historical parallel is obvious. The late Roman Empire expanded beyond sustainable limits and collapsed under the weight of defending impossibly long borders. The NCR has the right foundation for lasting civilization, but they're making the same mistakes that brought down history's greatest empires. They receive tier B+, strong foundation, but critical structural problems. The Enclave possesses the most advanced pre-war technology and manufacturing capability of any faction. Their power armor surpasses even the Brotherhood's equipment. Their energy weapons are cutting edge, and their vertebird fleets provide unmatched tactical mobility. They maintain institutional continuity from before the Great War, preserving not just technology, but the knowledge to manufacture and improve. Their hierarchical structure ensures clear command and efficient resource allocation. Unlike the NCR's democratic delays or the Legion's ideological constraints, the Enclave can make rapid strategic decisions and implement them effectively. They've got established bases with excellent defensive positions and the industrial capacity to maintain their technological advantages. The Enclave understands something most factions miss. Technology without the infrastructure to support it is worthless. They didn't just preserve laser rifles, they preserved the factories that make laser rifles. They didn't just save power armor, they saved the engineering knowledge to build better power armor. But they have one fatal limitation that dooms them to eventual extinction. Their elitist ideology severely restricts population growth. The Enclave's pure human requirements eliminate roughly 99% of potential recruits from considerization. In a world where genetic diversity is already compromised by radiation and small population sizes, they're artificially restricting themselves to an impossibly small gene pool. Their small population makes them vulnerable to single catastrophic losses. One successful enemy attack on a major facility could eliminate a significant percentage of their total membership. The historical parallel is Sparta, a militarily superior civilization that collapsed because their citizenship restrictions created demographic suicide. The Enclave has the technology to dominate the wasteland, but they don't have the population to sustain that dominance. They receive tier A-, technologically superior, but demographically doomed. The Institute wins because they've solved the three critical challenges that destroy every other faction, energy, labor, and security. Their underground facility provides the ultimate defensive advantage. Surface wars, radiation storms, and climate disasters can't touch them. They're literally immune to 90% of the threats that plague surface factions. Their fusion reactor eliminates resource scarcity entirely. While other factions fight over pre-war technology and finite resources, the Institute has unlimited clean energy for centuries. This powers their manufacturing, their research, their life support, everything needed for technological civilization. But here's the real game changer, synthetic workforce. Every other faction is limited by human population bottlenecks, 
but the Institute can manufacture their labor force. Need more farmers? Build agricultural synths. Need more soldiers? Build combat synths. Need more scientists? Build research synths. They've eliminated the demographic constraints that doom every other faction. The Institute maintains continuous technological advancement through dedicated research infrastructure. While others scavenge pre-war scraps, the Institute develops new technology. Their teleportation network provides strategic mobility that no other faction can match. Their advanced medical technology ensures population health and longevity. They control surface agriculture through their settlement network, securing food production without exposing their core population to surface dangers. Their scientific approach to resource management and efficiency optimization means they waste nothing and maximize everything. The counterintuitive truth that most players hate to acknowledge, the faction that seems most evil, has the best survival science. They've built the only true sustainable post-apocalyptic civilization. They receive Tier S, only faction with true long-term sustainability. Here's the key insight that most Fallout fans miss. Popularity doesn't equal scientific viability in post-apocalyptic survival. The Institute wins through boring but effective resource management, population sustainability, and risk mitigation. They're not the faction you want to root for, but they're the faction most likely to rebuild civilization. Which faction would you actually want to live under, and why? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I'm curious if science changes your perspective. If you enjoyed this breakdown of gaming worlds through real science, hit subscribe for more analytical deep dives into your favorite fictional universes.